Good morning, VTCA members. This is Gordon Dixon, the Executive Vice President for the Virginia Transportation Construction Alliance, and welcome to our highly anticipated 20 employment law facts you should know. Uh, as you all know, there have been several significant changes, uh, both at the state and federal level around employment law, and we felt it was critical to inform our members and update them on, on the changes that are happening with this. Uh, we are providing you all today a free webinar. This webinar is being recorded, and uh, we have a question and answer session that will be held at the end of the session. So as you move along, you can see down at the bottom of your, um, your screen, you have a, a place where you can type in your, your questions and answers, and we'll do some questions and answers at the end of this session. So I'm very pleased to uh, have Ann Bebo uh, with the Van Dieven and Art and Black law firm join us today. She has presented with us before, and she's actually presented with us um, at my previous organization as well. So uh, she is highly accomplished in the employment law section and understands a lot of the, the tricky components that you all need to stay compliant with as Virginia and uh, the nation navigates through the several different components through this year in 2020. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to let Ann kind of kick it off and go forward from there. Ann, All right, thanks. Welcome. Thank, thank you, Gordon. I appreciate it. And thanks to the VC, VTCA for putting this on. Good morning, everyone. I appreciate you joining me. And oh, I'd also like to thank Van Dievender Black's marketing team, Kristen Fletcher and Jennifer Serrano, for their assistance in running this presentation. I'm going to be discussing 20 employment law facts that everyone should know. As Gordon mentioned, there's been a lot of changes this year, so we've got quite a bit to cover. You can, as he mentioned, put in your questions using the Q&A forum, and at the end of the presentation, I'll try to get to as many as I can. Next slide, please. So that's me. I'm a partner with the law firm of Andy Evander Black, and I focus my practice on labor and employment law. You can go to the next slide. All right, so let's just jump on in. Um, the number one thing, and I can tell you these 20 employment law facts are in no particular order except for this one. This is the one I thought was the most important thing. I'm, you know, I'm going to be throwing a lot of facts at you, a lot of details and information, and you may not retain it all after you log off this program, but the one thing I'm hoping that you retain, the most important piece of information to walk away with is it's not the same old dominion anymore. Virginia has radically changed this year. Before 2020, Virginia was a very pro-employer state. We had very few employment laws. We primarily followed the federal laws. And as a result, it was very easy to practice employment law in Virginia because we just didn't have any of our own laws. And we would always look down our nose at um, those poor people out in California and up in New York who are just um, have all these really super pro-employee laws. Well, Virginia has completely changed and we have now become a very pro-employee state. There were a number of brand new laws passed this year that shift the um, scales against employers in employment law matters and decidedly in favor of employees. And as a result, there's a much greater risk of liability for employers in Virginia starting this year, starting July, July 1st of this year. Some of the laws I'm going to talk about go into effect early next year, but most of them are already in effect. So the number one thing I want you to take away is you need to start looking at how you're handling all of your employment law practices, all of your personnel practices. You need to have your employee handbook revised. If you don't have an employee handbook, you must get one now. There are certain new notices you have to post. You need to ramp up your employee training with regard to discrimination and other employment matters. You need to reevaluate all your personnel practices. When you're getting ready to terminate someone, when you're getting ready to discipline someone, you, you need to stop and look at how you're doing it and make sure you're doing it in a non-discriminatory way. I'm sure all of you think that you don't discriminate against employees, and you probably don't, but the standard is such that you will have a difficult time proving that you didn't discriminate unless you do things properly, really dot your I's and cross your T's. You need to look at your payroll practices. If you have any independent contractors, you need to do a hard stop and look at those relationships because they may very well be illegal now. You need to look at any employment agreements you have, particularly if you use non-compete agreements. There's a new law that went into effect on that that I'm gonna talk about. If you have any agreements where you're giving employees commissions, 
you need to take a look at that's going to be impacted. So it, just in short, there are a whole bunch of changes. And so if you remember nothing else from this presentation, just remember that everything has changed and you need to look at all of your practices with fresh eyes. Next slide, please. So the first law I'm going to talk about is a new law that, that's going to go into effect on July 1, which is just around the corner. And it creates a legal presumption that anyone who performs work for a business in exchange for remuneration is an employee. The purpose of this law is to almost, not completely, but almost eradicate independent contractors. The government has always um, been opposed to the whole concept of independent contractor because you're not collecting employment taxes on those workers. And so the government's not getting as much tax revenue. So in past years, we've seen the state of Virginia kind of ramp up enforcement on whether individuals have been misclassified as independent contractors. And now this new law gives those efforts real teeth. So not only are you prohibited from misclassifying someone as an independent contractor when they should be an employee, but you're also prohibited from requiring or requesting an individual to enter into an agreement or sign any document that results in misclassification. So that means you need to know what you're doing up front before you even ask someone to sign an independent contractor agreement, because if you got it wrong, if the person should have been classified as an employee, even asking him or her to sign that agreement or enter or sign any document that would classify them as an independent contractor, just doing that is a violation of the law. The burden is on the employer to prove um, using an IRS test that an individual is properly classified as an independent contractor. So the presumption, again, the legal presumption is going to be that everyone is an employee and you're going to have to prove otherwise. So that's a major shift. And I know a lot of businesses frequently use independent contractors and they should take a very hard look at that. And most likely a lot of those relationships are going to need to put those people on the payroll and, and classify them as employees. Next slide, please. So the consequences for getting this wrong are, are pretty steep. First of all, there are civil penalties, and I have the amounts there, 1,000 for the first offense, um, 2,500 for the second offense, 5,000 for subsequent offenses, and those penalties are all per individual. So if you have multiple people misclassified, those penalties will rack up pretty quickly. Um, most significantly for this audience to keep in mind is if you are considered a repeat offender, meaning if you've just done it more than once, that you've misclassified someone as an independent contractor, you will be debarred from public contracting in the state of Virginia. So that's going to be a, a major blow for a lot of businesses. Also, the law requires the various state agencies to share information about misclassification. So if the Department of Labor and Industry finds out that you've misclassified as an independent someone as an independent contractor, they will notify the BEC. They will notify the tax commissioner, and you'll get a tax bill. Um, the same with the BEC. If they realize that you've misclassified, they're going to notify all those other government agencies and you're going to have other problems. So this is pretty serious. Um, but what perhaps is the worst part of this law for businesses is it creates a cause of action, a private cause of action for any worker to bring against your business claiming that they have been misclassified, that they should have been classified as an employee and you classified them as an independent contractor. And when they bring that lawsuit, they can recover wages and other compensation. And why that's a risk for you is if you've classified them as an independent contractor, you probably weren't keeping track of the hours that they work, and you certainly weren't paying them overtime. Well, they're going to come in and they're going to say they were working overtime, and you're going to owe them a lot in back pay for overtime compensation. Also, you're going to be liable for any benefits that you would have provided to them had they been an employee including any expenses that would have been covered by insurance if you'd had them on your employee group health plan. So worst case scenario, you can imagine if you had a worker that you thought was an independent contractor and while he was performing work for you, he was diagnosed with cancer and had to have very expensive medical treatment for his cancer and you offered a group health insurance plan to your employees but he couldn't participate because he wasn't an employee. When he brings this lawsuit, you're going to owe all of his medical bills. You're going to have to pay all those benefits that would have been covered by insurance had he been an employee. 
plus, of course, the legislature has provided that the employee will recover, or I'm sorry, the former independent contractor will recover attorney's fees and costs. So these lawsuits are going to be very expensive for businesses. Oh, in addition, another example of an expense that would have been covered by insurance, if that independent contractor had a workplace accident and they weren't covered by your workers' comp policy because you thought they were an independent contractor, that's another example where you're going to owe all their medical bills. So next slide, please. Unpaid wages. There is a new law that went into effect on July 1 in Virginia that creates a new private cause of action for employees to bring when they feel that they haven't been paid properly. Now, all along employees could sue under the Fair Labor Standards Act if you weren't paying minimum wage or if you failed to pay overtime. This is a much broader law and it's modeled a little bit on the FLSA in that employees can bring the lawsuit on behalf of themselves and similarly situated employees as a collective action. So you can have one of your employees who's disgruntled file a suit against your business on behalf of himself and on behalf of all similarly situated employees that worked for your company at any time in the past three years. So you can imagine these can be pretty big suits and you may very well believe that you've paid all of your employees properly and that you don't not pay employees what they're owed, but there are frequent um, disagreements between employees and employers on what the wages should be, and that would be a cause of action under this law. The reason I mentioned in one of my opening slides agreements that call for commissions is we frequently see disputes between employees and employers on what commissions are owed for employees who earn commissions. And it's very important now under this new law that you have really carefully worded any commissions agreement or offer letter or any other document that discuss commissions to make sure that it's very clear when employers are going to be owed commissions because we're going to see suits brought under this law with employees claiming that they're owed commissions. Um, another area that I think is going to be a problem for employers is unauthorized deductions. This is this has been a problem for years in that often businesses don't understand that if an employee breaks something or um, loses something, you can't just automatically deduct that cost from their paycheck. You have to have written authorization for the deduction. And so frequently we'll see employers docking employees pay for money that the employee owes the employer without the employee's written permission. That's an unauthorized deduction and that will lead to a cause of action. So with all those different ways or all those different potential claims an employee could have for unpaid wages, they can bring a private cause of action against the business. They can recover any wages owed plus liquidated damages, which is equal to the wages owed, so it's basically double damages, plus interest, plus attorney's fees. And if they show that the employer's failure to pay was knowing, and I'll talk a little bit about what knowing means in a minute, but if they can show knowing, then they actually recover triple the amount of wages due plus attorney's fees and costs and interest. So these are going to be very expensive lawsuits. In addition, the uh, commissioner can impose a civil penalty against the business. The commissioner will issue a written decision on um, assessing a penalty. You'll only have 15 days to challenge the assessment and then the decision becomes final. Next slide, please. So knowing, I mentioned that if the employer, if the, I'm sorry, if the employee shows that your failure to pay wages was a knowing violation, they can recover triple back pay. So knowing is very broadly defined in the statute. Um, the first definition you would expect is when you act with actual knowledge of the information, but it's also defined to include acting in deliberate ignorance of the truth or falsity of the information and acting in reckless disregard to the truth or falsity of the information. So that means that there's really a burden on the employers to be proactive in figuring out what they could possibly owe. There's no requirement that the employee prove that the employer had any specific intent to defraud. Um, so that's not required. So knowing is a very broadly defined term there. We expect to see the plaintiffs in all these cases will probably allege a knowing failure to pay the wages owed. There are also criminal penalties. The um, commissioner can investigate and bring an action against the employer 
even if no employee consents. So even if all your employees are happy, you can still get sued by the government for violating this law. And then the commissioner can um, recover attorney's fees of one third of the award amount. So it's really important that you take a look at all the payroll deductions that you're doing. Make sure you have written authorization for them. Take a look at your timekeeping practices. It's quite common to find out that a low level supervisor has instructed an employee to do some work off the clock. That would be a non-payment of wages. That would also be an FLSA violation. So we expect to see some lawsuits arising out of those type of practices. And as I mentioned, any compensation agreements, you really need to take a hard look at and make sure they're worded properly. Next slide, please. Another new law that has already gone into effect in Virginia makes contractors liable for their sub subcontractors' unpaid wages. And this is for construction contracts. Any non-residential construction project or um, exceeding $500,000 would be subject to this law. So if any construction contract entered into on or after July 1st, there shall be deemed to include a provision under which the general contractor and the subcontractor at any tier are jointly and severally liable to pay any subcontractor's employees. All wages do. So that means that the general contractor and other contractors on the site who have subs have an affirmative duty to look into how their subcontractors are paying employees and to make sure they're paying them properly. Otherwise, the contractor can be deemed liable for the sub's non-payment of wages. The subcontractor has to indemnify the general contractor for any damages unless the subcontractor's failure was due to the general contractor's failure to pay money to, due to the subcontractor. Now, this does require proof that the general contractor knew or should have known that the subcontractor wasn't paying his employees. But note, as I described in the last slide, knowing is very broadly defined. So a knowing failure um, would include if you were acting in deliberate ignorance, if you weren't taking steps to ensure that people were paying their employees properly, that could be considered knowing um, a knowing violation. Next slide, please. Discrimination claims will be more common and they will be much more expensive to defend. And that's because the Virginia Human Rights Act has been amended. The amendment went into effect on July 1st of this year. You may have seen some news reports about this. The media made a big deal out of two amendments to the Virginia Human Rights Act that, in my mind, are the least significant changes. And that is that Virginia has now recognized that sexual orientation and gender identity are protected characteristics. Well, the Supreme Court also ruled this summer that those are protected characteristics under Title VII. So that's really not a big deal. And most courts are leaning in that direction anyway. So again, that's really not a big deal in terms of a change for um, actual lawsuits, actual litigation. The other um, change that was made that, again, in my mind, is not as significant is that the General Assembly clarified that race discrimination would include discrimination against someone based on hair texture or hairstyle if the hair texture or hairstyle is closely associated with a race. Again, that got a lot of publicity. I really don't think that was that big of a change. The biggest change, the most significant change, and the one that you should all walk away remembering is that the cause of action under the Virginia Human Rights Act for an employee to bring against an employer claiming discrimination has greatly expanded. Previously, very few people could bring a um, cause of action, could bring a lawsuit under the Virginia Human Rights Act, and it really only applied to the very small employers, those with fewer than six employees. Now it's been greatly expanded so that an employee can bring a claim of harassment or discrimination under the law against a business that has 15 or more employees. They can bring a unlawful discharge under the law based on age against an employer that has between six and 19 employees. And they can bring a claim for unlawful dis discharge, unlawful determination based on any protected characteristic other than age if the employer has 15 or more employees. And why this is significant is previously those claims would most most of them would be subject to Title VII, which is a federal law. And to bring a suit under Title VII, you first have to file a charge with the EEOC and exhaust your administrative remedies. And then you would go to federal court under Title VII 
And in federal court, there's a procedure called summary judgment, where if the employer shows that the undisputed material facts support the employer's argument, then the court will dismiss the case early on and it never goes to a jury trial. Also, Title VII has caps on, on compensatory damages. So there are limits on how much money a person can recover under Title VII based on the size of the business. Well, under the Virginia Human Rights Act, there is no administrative exhaustion requirement. Your employee can go straight to court. They don't have to go through any government agency. They can just go straight into court with their lawsuit against your business. Virginia State Court does not have a summary judgment procedure or rather its summary judgment procedure is extremely limited and would not be available in this type of litigation. That means that these cases are going to go to jury trial. They're going to be very expensive to, to defend because of that. And then finally, the other big difference between the Virginia Human Rights Act and Title VII is the Virginia Human Rights Act does not have a cap on damages. So the jury would be Avail would be allowed to award as much as they felt was um, necessary to compensate your employee. So this is going to be a real problem for employers, and this is why I said it's very important that you start taking a close look at all of your personnel practices. Next slide, please. Okay, so what can you do besides take a look at all your personnel practices and beef up your training and review your handbook and make the other best practices changes that you should be making anyway. Another thing that you can do to help protect your business is get arbitration agreements with your employees. This is not a one size fits all solution. It's not right for every business and you really need to proceed with caution, but it's something that you ought to look into as a way to help protect your business. There are a lot of pros and cons to having arbitration agreements, and I'm gonna review some of them, but just so you all understand what an arbitration agreement is, this is an agreement that you would have with individual employees, and you would really need to roll it out to all your employees so you don't have a discrimination claim based on just certain employees have to sign. But all of your employees would be asked to sign a arbitration agreement in which they agree before having any dispute with your company that if they do have a dispute with your company, they will go to arbitration instead of to court. Those agreements are generally enforceable with a few caveats I'm going to mention in a minute. And some of the advantages to those agreements is you can, in drafting those agreements, prohibit the employee from bringing their claim on a class action basis or a collective action basis so they can only submit it as an individual cause of action. That helps reduce the, some of the risks I talked about in the preceding slides. In general, plaintiff's counsel, plaintiff, plaintiff's attorney find, plaintiff's attorneys find businesses with arbitration agreements to be less attractive. There's this perception amongst the plaintiff's bar that they don't do as well in arbitration as they do in jury trials. Now, a lot of that perception, not necessarily reality, plaintiffs do prevail in employment law arbitrations just as much as they can prevail in state court or in federal court. But there is this perception that an arbitrator will not be as easily persuaded as a jury can be. At least that's the perception. One of the big advantages to arbitration is you get to basically pick your own judge. The parties select the arbitrator. So if you see an arbitrator that for some reason you don't trust, you don't like, you think he would be biased, you just don't pick him and you look for an arbitrator that you feel would be um, objective and fair. So the disputes are heard by an arbitrator instead of by a jury. That's a huge advantage. Arbitration is private, whereas all court proceedings are open to the public. And so sometimes these disputes can be embarrassing for your company and arbitration is a way to keep that um, under wraps. Typically, arbitration is faster than court litigation. Not always, but typically it is. And it can be cheaper than court litigation. Again, not always, but it can be. Also, arbitration, depending on which set of rules you pick, and that's another great advantage to arbitration, you get to pick which rules apply. Um, and I mean procedural rules, not substantive law, but the procedural rules. Certain, a lot of the procedural rules, such as the AAA employment law rules, allow for dispositive motions. That summary judgment that I was mentioning, you can't get in state court, you often can get it in arbitration if the facts are on your side. Now, there are certainly a lot of downsides to doing arbitration agreements. As I said, it's not a solution for all businesses. Um, one of the biggest downside is in employment arbitration, the employer is going to pay most 
if not all of the arbitrator's fees. And I'm going to tell you a scary tale about DoorDash, which you're probably familiar. It's one of those um, online businesses that will go pick up your takeout order and bring it to your door. They were hit with um, the downside of arbitration. They had a provision in their arbitration agreements prohibiting collective actions, which meant that the employees had to file individual claims against the company. And when they filed the individual claims, the company DoorDash was responsible for the filing fees because that's how employment law arbitration works. And as a result, they end up having to pay $12 million in filing fees before the cases even began, just in filing fees, because such a large number of employees came forward with these claims. That's very unusual. Um, in fact, that's the only time I've heard of that happening, but it is something just to be aware of as the downside to arbitration. A more common downside to arbitration is sometimes employees balk. They don't like it when the employer asks them to sign arbitration agreements. So that's something to consider. It could affect morale. Another downside is the various legislatures, um, both state and Congress, have at times tried to ban arbitration agreements in some form or other. All those efforts to date have failed. They've been ruled um, to be in violation of the Federal Arbitration Act. But it is something to keep in mind that this is something that is constantly under attack from um, certain bands of the political spectrum. If you are a defense contractor, there's special consideration you have to give to arbitration agreements because they are prohibited for a certain class of employment law claims, but you can draft around that to allow everything else to go to arbitration. Uh, and most importantly, um, when the downsides is, this is not something you can um, do yourself. This is, you know, don't try this at home. If you're going to do an arbitration agreement, you definitely have to have legal counsel draft it for you because they're, they are tricky agreements to put together. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the next um, fact you should be aware of is you do have to implement best practices to reduce your risk of discrimination claims. As I mentioned earlier, you want to have a legal review of your handbook. You want to put in place um, annual training. There is a requirement for certain state contractors to have an annual sexual harassment training for their employees. You need to make sure that all of your personnel practices are compliant and also consistent. That's really the name of the game with employment discrimination. How have you treated similarly situated employees in the same circumstance. Any discipline really has to be documented so that you can prove that you had a non-discriminatory reason for it. And the same with termination. You need to have documentation. Um, any performance issues, you have to document. Uh, don't make the mistake of having performance evaluations that are all glowing. Um, I see that quite a bit where the employer, the employer wants to terminate someone for poor performance, and I look at the person's per performance reviews and they're all perfect, exceeds expectations. And now you want to fire him for poor performance? It doesn't look good. And then as I mentioned, you always want to do the comparative analysis. How have you treated similarly situated employees in the same circumstances? Next slide, please. Be aware that the minimum wage is going up in Virginia. The federal minimum wage is currently the law and that's 7.25 an hour, but the General Assembly has passed an increase to our minimum wage. It uh, was going to go into effect earlier, but they've postponed the effective date to May 1, 2021. It'll go up to 9.50 an hour then. In 2022, it goes up to $11 an hour, $12 an hour in 2023. And then they're going to do a pause and study in um, 2024, after which it may go up to $13.50 in 2025 and $15 an hour in 2026. If you're a federal contractor, be aware that the minimum wage for federal contractors goes up to $10.95 an hour on January 1st. Next slide, please. Pregnancy discrimination. There is a new requirement, um, a new law in Virginia that went into effect on July 1 that creates a um, requirement that employers engage in the interactive process with pregnant employees about what accommodations the employee might need. And that's um, emphasis on active, interactive process. You really have to engage with the employee about what accommodations she needs, what you can provide, and how that would help her perform her duties during her pregnancy. The law prohibits discrimination based on pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions. And so related medical conditions would include lactation, 
it creates a private cause of action. And as with the Virginia Human Rights Act changes I mentioned earlier, there's no administrative exhaustion requirement. The employee can go straight to court. But another thing that you really need to um, put into place immediately is the law requires that you have a notice that describes your prohibition against discrimination based on pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions. And the notice also has to explain that the employee has a right to reasonable accommodations for um, those conditions. You have to post that notice in conspicuous places in the workplace. You have to include it in your handbook. My favorite part of the law, because it's just so silly, you have to give the notice directly to all new hires, even the men. <laughs> Again, I, I don't know what the General Assembly was thinking, but you're required to give your um, all new employees, even the men, um, a notice about your policy against discriminating based on pregnancy and how you're going to accommodate them if they get pregnant. You have to also give this notice directly to any employee who announces she's pregnant within 10 days of that announcement. I know that's redundant. You posted the notice, you put it in your handbook, you gave it to her on the day she was hired, but then when she tells you she's pregnant, you have to give it to her again. Next slide, please. Non-competes are now banned in Virginia for employees who make less than the average weekly wage. That law went into effect on July 1. Um, what may really surprise you is that the definition of, um, so it applies to low wage employees and they define low wage employees as being anyone who makes less than the average weekly wage. That's going to fluctuate from year to year, of course, but as of July 1st, that's anyone who's making less than $20.30 an hour or $1,137 per week or $59,124 annually. And I think a lot of people would be surprised to know that someone making in the 50s is considered a low wage earner in Virginia, but they are. So someone making less than $59,000 a year is considered a low wage earner and it is against the law to um, ask them to enter into a non-compete or to enforce a non-compete or threaten to enforce a non-compete against one of those individuals. You are still allowed to have non-disclosure agreements. Non-solicitation agreements um, may be permissible, but they have to be very carefully worded. If you violate the law, there's a $10,000 civil penalty, plus the employee would have a private cause of action against the company and they could recover attorney's fees and costs. You have to post a copy of this statute in your workplace, in a conspicuous place in your workplace, so that bulletin board where you put up all the other required postings to your employees, you have to post a copy of this new law. And I think a lot of businesses are not aware of that requirement, but you do have to do that. That is required that you print out a copy of the statute and put it on the poster board, even though you've never used non-competes in your workplace. Doesn't matter, you still have to post this law. Next slide, please. Project labor agreements, they are coming. Um, a project labor agreement is a pre-hire collective bargaining agreement with one or more labor organization, organizations that establishes the terms and conditions of employment for a specific construction project. So before any workers are even hired on the project, the construction union has a bargaining right with the employer to determine the wage rates and the benefits for all the employees that will be on the project and to agree to other provisions regarding the project. Um, previously, state agencies could not require or prohibit adherence to a project labor agreement. It was basically state neutrality on project labor agreements. But the new law, which goes into effect on May 1st, will permit the state or any locality to mandate the use of a project labor agreement on any project. We expect to see this first appear in Northern Virginia, but there will likely be pressure in other areas to follow. So now is the time to start educating yourselves about project labor agreements and how you would handle that if a project did have that. Next slide, please. Defer payroll tax withholdings at your own risk. You've probably seen in the news um, over the last month that President Trump issued an executive memorandum that deferred collection of payroll taxes for um, September through December of this year. Now that um, memorandum and the IRS guidance that followed made clear that if you do collect the taxes, you must deposit them, but you can wait to collect the taxes until next year. 
which would mean that your employees would have a slight pay raise between September and December because their take-home pay would be slightly more. But you have to um, collect and deposit those deferred taxes next year between January 1st and April 30th. And they're going to start, the IRS will start assessing interest penalties and additions to tax beginning on May 1st. Please note this is at the employer's option. You don't have to do it. A lot of employers are not doing it because there are several downsides to this. Even though the employees going to have, have a, the employees will have a slight bump in their take-home pay in 2020 for the remainder of this year. As a result, they will have double taxation next year between January and April, when you're making up those deferred taxes. They'll go from having the normal payroll tax withholdings from their paycheck to double the normal payroll taxes withheld from their paycheck. So they'll see a significant decrease in their pay early next year. You're going to have some very angry employees if you do this. So if you do want to do it, I would strongly recommend you get their written consent because they're going to be up in arms when they see their pay cuts check their pay checks cut next year. Also, the employer is going to be liable for the deferred taxes if the employees aren't with you. So imagine if you have not withheld the employees payroll taxes for the remainder of 2020, come January 2021, this employee no longer works for your business you're on the hook for those payroll taxes because they still have to be paid. And that's going to be up to the business to make up that um, shortfall. So as I said, if you choose to do this, you're doing it at your own risk. There are a lot of downsides to this. Next slide, please. Virginia has its own COVID safety standard. We're the only state in the nation to do this, but our um, Virginia Occupational Safety and Health, Bosch, has issued the emergency temporary standard. It went into effect on July 20th, I'm sorry, July 27th. It remains in effect for six months unless it's made permanent. And it looks like it probably will be. It's gonna be a man, so there, the emergency temporary standard, if you haven't familiarized yourself with it yet, you really need to because it is in effect and you can be cited for violation of the standard if you're subject to both jurisdiction and almost all employers are unless you're on a federal enclave. Um, or if you're a waterfront employer. There are one aspect of the temporary standard creates certain requirements for all employers. First of all, all employers need to categorize their employees and tasks according to their exposure risk for COVID. You have to have policies and procedures for all your employees to report symptoms if they have them. You have to prohibit known or suspected cases at the work site. You need to have flexible sick leave policies. If you are a building owner, you have to notify other tenants of cases. And conversely, if you are a tenant in a building and you have an employee test positive, you have to let the um, building owner or facility owner know. If you have an employee test positive, the standard requires that you notify the Virginia Department of Health of any positive cases. I have had several employers tell me that when they called the Virginia Department of Health to notify them of this, of a positive case, the Virginia Department of Health's response has been, why are you telling me? We learned that from the testing sites. You don't need to call and tell us. So there seems to be a disconnect between what Vosch required and the emergency temporary standard and what the Virginia Department of Health knows, because apparently they weren't notified of this requirement. Nonetheless, if you have someone test positive, make the call anyway and just document that you did it, even though the person on the other end at the Department of Health is going to say, don't tell me, I don't need to know that. Make a note that you made that call and who you spoke with just so you can prove that you did it. And then if you have three or more positive cases in a two week period, you're also required to notify the Department of Labor and Industry. That's considered a hot spot. Next slide, please. The emergency temporary standard has a non-discrimination clause and it, um, prohibits any retaliation against employees for raising or reporting concerns about coronavirus at work, um, for using PPE voluntarily. So if an employee is in a position where you don't require PPE, but the employee wants to wear PPE because they think it's going to keep them safe from coronavirus or some other reason, you can't discriminate or, or punish them for that. Um, unless you determine that whatever PPE they're wearing actually creates a bigger hazard, depending on their job duties. But otherwise, you, you have to allow them to bring in their own PPE if they'd like to do so. 
And that's, again, for people who aren't required to wear PPE as part of their um, job duties. There is a notice you have to give them from the OSHA standards about voluntary use of PPE. So I recommend you look that up and hand that out if anyone wants to do that. You're also not allowed to discriminate against employees if they have made a reasonable refusal to work because they're concerned about some coronavirus risk. So that's going to be kind of tricky for employers to navigate around. If you have medium exposure risk employees, and I assume that everyone on this call does because construction work is generally considered to be medium exposure risk, not necessarily, but in most circumstances, construction work would be medium exposure risk. You have to have in place a written infectious disease preparedness and response plan. You have to do a hazard assessment of each job site. You have to pre-screen or survey employees for symptoms before each shift. You have to give um, face coverings to any visitors who appear to have um, symptoms, and then you have to tell them to get off the job site right away. You also, um, have to give face coverings to any of your employees who can't maintain social distancing and doing their job tasks and require them to wear those. And of course, you have to make hand washing, cleaning, and disinfecting available to your employees. Next slide, please. We're all, we're all epidemiologists now. Um, I don't know about everyone on this call, but I think I have never been on the CDC website before the year 2020. And now I'm on the CDC's website every week, sometimes every day. Um, the CDC guidance is updated frequently. It's um, Note that it differs from the Virginia Emergency Temporary Standards in a few different ways. Now, if you comply with the CDC guidance, that gives you a good faith defense to a violation charge under the Emergency Temporary Standard. It's a really good idea to be looking at the CDC's website frequently and to do what you can to comply with their guidance. It's just guidance. It's not mandatory. It's not considered law. But certainly, if you're not doing what the CDC says you should do, that's going to make it easier for someone to say that you are negligent in spreading coronavirus. But if you're doing everything you can under the CDC guidance and complying with it to a T, it puts you in a much better position to defend any allegations that your business was negligent and that your negligence caused someone to catch COVID. So I strongly recommend you take a look and start complying. Again, it's something that I think most of us have never done before, but now we should all be very familiar with the CDC website. You'll see that they have various information sheets um, regarding things like self-isolation, when employees can return to work, um, what symptoms are, what does close contact mean, what is, when has someone been exposed, what does exposure mean? And as I mentioned, there are some differences between CDC and the Virginia Emergency Temporary Standard. And those differences are caused by the fact that the CDC has been updating its guidance so frequently that its guidance changed right after the Emergency Temporary Standard was published. So that's, they just haven't updated the Emergency Temporary Standard. Um, but between when it was published and I think it was two days later, the CDC said, we don't recommend testing anymore. So there are a lot of differences there. Next slide, please. I've been getting some questions about this lately. I guess some people are just very optimistic about what if they come out with a vaccine for coronavirus. If they do, can we make our employees take it? And the answer is yes. You can mandate vaccinations in your workplace, not just for coronavirus, but, but any other disease. You can mandate that your employees have vaccinations. But if an employee comes to you and says, I can't take the vaccine because of um, some medical condition I have, or I have a religious objection to the vaccine, you may need to make an accommodation for that employee. So just keep that in mind. If we ever get to that, um, that point where we actually have a vaccine, that will be something you'll need to address then. Next slide, please. FSRA, the Families First Coronavirus Act, you do have to provide FSRA paid leave. Um, this is the law that went into effect back in the spring. It was effective on April 1. It's going to be effective through the end of 2020, and it applies to all employers with fewer than 500 employees. There is a very limited exception for small businesses with fewer than 50 employees, but it's not an automatic exception. You have to make a determination 
that providing the paid leave would jeopardize the um, existence of your business as a going concern. So it's kind of a high burden there, especially if you keep in mind that the paid leave is refundable to the business. The business gets a fully refundable tax credit for all the paid leave provided under the FSCRA. But in order to get that paid leave, you do need to collect documentation from the employee that would support application of one of those two types of paid leave, either Emergency Family Medical Leave Act, which I'm calling eFEMLA, or Emergency Paid Sick Leave. If you don't have the documentation, you can expect the IRS to deny your request for a tax refund or a tax credit based on that um, leave. And I've seen some businesses who misunderstand their requirements for this paid leave, particularly emergency paid sick leave, and are giving paid leave to employees when they don't really meet the requirements under the law. And it's nice of the employer and it's very generous of the employer, but the employer will not receive a, a tax credit for that. So you really have to make sure you take a close look at this. There is a notice that you have to post even if you are able to take advantage of that limited exception for small businesses and not um, provide the paid leave, you still have to post the notice about the paid leave. Doesn't make any sense, but that's what the law requires. Um, the Department of Labor late last week, um, Friday evening actually issued a revision to its temporary rule, which provides guidance on how the FFCRA paid leave is administered. For this audience, the, um, the main change wouldn't have any impact, and that was um, an exemption for healthcare providers, and that's been modified, so I don't think anyone on this call will be interested in that. The only part that I think would be of interest to this audience regarding the new tempor the revised temporary rule is that the Department of Labor um, reaffirmed its position that you only have to provide intermittent leave if the employer agrees. That's voluntary on the part of the employer. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go through this part um, kind of quickly because I'm hoping everyone's familiar with this by now. The eFEMLA provision of the um, Families First Coronavirus Response Act, that's only available for employees who've worked at least 30 days for the business. And it's only available if the employee is unable to work or telework due to a need for leave to care for a minor son or daughter if the um, child's school or child care provider is closed because of COVID. Um, it's capped at 12 weeks. It doesn't expand the normal amount of FEMLA. So if you have an employee who is already eligible for FEMLA, this will chip away at how much FEMLA they have. The first 10 days is unpaid unless the employee opts to use any available paid leave, such as the emergency paid sick leave. After the first 10 days, the um, eFEMLA is paid at two-thirds the employee's regular rate. Next slide, please. So the other category of paid leave under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act is EPSL, Emergency Paid Sick Leave. That's up to 80 hours of paid leave if the employee is unable to work or telework because of one of these six enumerated um, criteria. Uh, I'd like to point out this is only one time. Um, so even if the employee has multiple incidents, they only get that one set of 80 hours of emergency paid sick leave. Unlike the emergency FEMLA, the employee doesn't have to have worked for your business for any length of time. They're eligible on day one of employment. So the six um, criteria are, or the six reasons for EPSL are if the employee is subject to a government quarantine or isolation order related to COVID. The second, and this is the one I see come up, um, two and three are the two I see come up most often. Two is the employee has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine due to concerns related to COVID-19. Note that they have to be advised by a healthcare provider. So if you as the employer tell the employee, you've been exposed to COVID, go home for 14 days, that does not qualify the, emp the employee for EPSL. If you give them paid leave, you won't get a tax credit for it unless the employee then goes see to see their doctor and their doctor says, yeah, you should self-isolate then they get the paid leave. Um, but just the employer sending the employee home would not qualify them for the EPSL. The third category, or I'm sorry, the third reason is that the employee is experiencing symptoms and seeking a medical diagnosis. The fourth is if the person is caring for an individual who's subject to um, one or two. The fifth is if the person, um, the fifth overlaps with eFEMLA, it's when the employee needs to take time off because his or her child's school or daycare provider has been closed. 
And the sixth reason doesn't exist yet. That's when um, the Secretary of Health and Human Services designates other conditions. They haven't done that yet. Um, leave for reasons one through three is paid at the full rate and leave for reasons four through six is paid at two thirds of the employee's regular rate. Next slide, please. There are new whistleblower protections in Virginia. Uh, this went into effect on July 1st and it protects employees for, from retaliation for reporting questionable, suspicious, or unlawful employer activity. Uh, retaliation would be discharge, discipline, discrimination, penalties, other adverse actions. There are um, some limited exceptions where the employee would not be protected, such as when the employee has disclosed privileged or protected data, but even there, that's, um, there's some exceptions to that. There's an exception if the employee is knowingly making a false um, statement or acts with reckless disregard to the truth. And there's also an exception if making the disclosure is in violation of federal or state law or um, impairs a common law confidentiality protection. So this is just another step you're gonna to have to go through in your analysis of whether you can discipline or discharge an employee or take any other adverse action. You're gonna to need to do um, some research into whether the employee has made any type of complaints about the employer's activities, um, calling them either suspicious or unlawful or questionable. So just something else you have to jump through. Next slide, please. This is a new law that went into effect, but it's not a new law. And what I mean by that is the Virginia legislature issued or enacted a law that prohibits discharge or retaliation against an employee for discussing wages. Great, that's always been the law. Um, under federal law, it has always been illegal to um, discharge or retaliate against employees for discussing wages. Nonetheless, um, when I review employee handbooks, quite frequently I will see in employee handbooks a provision prohibiting the employees from discussing their wages. And I always have to take it out and explain to the employer, that's illegal, you can't do that. Well, the General Assembly has made it extra clear for Virginia employers, you can't do that. Um, there is an exception if you have an employee who's in a confidential um, position, and by that I mean someone like your HR people whose job it is to look at other, or whose job gives them access as part of their essential job functions to compensation information of other employees. They're not allowed to go around blabbing about what they've seen in other employees' personnel files, but you can't stop an employee from talking about her own wages or from asking her coworker, hey, how much do you make? Hey, how much does Joe make? They're allowed to do that. Next slide, please. Don't ask about simple possession of marijuana. Um, simple possession, which is possession of one ounce or less, has been decriminalized in Virginia, effective July 1. And the law that they passed also includes a prohibition against employers asking applicants to disclose information relating to charges of simple possession. So you can't do that. And that there's actually a criminal penalty against employers if they do. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, the final point I want to make before we go to the Q&A um, section is I want to um, talk about an unpleasant topic, but unfortunately, given the economic crisis that so much of America is facing, we're seeing a lot of this, and I've certainly been advising a lot of clients about this lately, and that is when you do have to trim your workforce uh, because of the economic downturn. So you'll see the words layoff and furlough thrown around and I get some questions about that. And there really isn't a legal definition for those terms. It kind of means what you want it to mean, but in Virginia, they don't have independent legal meaning. Most businesses use layoffs to be um, when they separate someone from employment for an indefinite period, it may end up being permanent. You don't know when you terminate them, but for all intents and purposes, it's really a termination. You're hoping you might be able to call them back, but you don't make any promises of that. And that's that's usually the way businesses use the word layoff, um, but you know it's really indistinguishable from a termination. Furloughs are typically, and again, it depends on how the business uses it, but usually a, a furlough is a more definite period where you're telling the employee, I don't have any work for you for the next month, you're on furlough, I will recall you on 
October 15th. That's usually what a furlough is, and they stay employed, but they're not drawing pay. Whichever way you have to go, if you have to actually terminate people, do layoffs or furloughs, it's very important that you um, proceed cautiously so that you don't generate liability for the company. You, it's always best to have an objective criteria for how you're selecting which employees go and which employees stay. Um, seniority is a great tool to, or great factor to point to because it's so clearly objective. It's just black and white. It's a date in the file and you're just laying off the most um, junior people. That's usually the most defensible, but often that doesn't work for a business because there are certain skill sets you need. So you just have to be very careful in that analysis. Um, if you are going to offer your employees some extra compensation when you let them go, such as severance pay or any other type of pay that isn't required, then you really should have them sign a general release. And you do need to get legal counsel to draft that for you in order for it to be enforceable. And that's particularly true for any employees age 40 or older because there's special requirements about their releases when you pay them extra um, pay. Also, just be aware of the WARN Act. Um, that's a law that's been in place for a long time, but it applies to businesses with 100 or more full-time employees and requires that they give 60 days notice of um, layoffs. And that's defined as a worksite closing affecting 50 or more employees or mass layoff affecting at least 50 employees and one third of the worksite work total workforce or 500 or more employees. So the definition's pretty, or the, the criteria where WARN Act comes into play is kind of complex, but it's just something to keep in mind if you're laying off a large number of people, you do need to seek counsel to make sure you're complying with the WARN Act. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm gonna to go to the Q&A. Um, let's see. Okay, so here's a question. Um, I just published it. Does Virginia use the ABC test like California now for independent contractors? No, Virginia is using the IRS um, factors test. I'm not sure what the ABC test is, but I think California has a, a different independent contractor test. And California, I think, is even more, more stringent than Virginia in who could be considered an independent contractor. They have an even more de narrow definition. So in Virginia, we are following the IRS's um, test, which is a 20-factor test to determine if someone's properly classified as an independent contractor. Um, let's see, another question here. I'll just go ahead and publish it and then I'll read it. For independent contractors, how far back does the law allow? Um, again, California and PAGA does not have a statute of limitations. Is the new law simply going forward from 7120 or does it allow for prior? The new law in Virginia goes only get, went into effect on, it doesn't go into effect until January 1, 2021. So it goes into effect next year on January 1st. It is not retroactive. So it would only apply going forward from January 1st. But even prior to that law going into effect, Virginia is looking more closely at independent contractor relationships. So if you have any right now, I do advise you to um, start evaluating those relationships to see if they're properly classified. Um, here's a question, and I'm not sure I'm going to have an answer to this. Would the wages liability issue with subs be protected by a PMP bond? I think it's going to depend on um, the bond. I don't have a good answer for you on that, but I think that's something you're going to have to look into when you have the bond issued. Um, Okay, the next question, is mandatory training of employees under the emergency temporary standards still required? Yes, it is. Uh, because of the short time frame for this um, presentation, I didn't hit all the requirements of the emergency temporary standard, but training is a part of it, especially if you have medium exposure risk employees, you are required to train them. So yes, that is a mandatory requirement. And here's an EPSL question. Under the emergency paid sick leave, if we have an employee with no symptoms that was exposed to a positive case or is living with someone with a confirmed positive case, do they qualify? The answer is only if a healthcare provider has directed them to self-isolate. You as the employer should tell someone who's been exposed, don't come in for 14 days because that's what the CDC recommends. 
but unless a healthcare provider tells them to self-isolate, they don't qualify for the EPSL. And the, I'll publish the last question. Um, how are office cleaners treated under the new independent contractors law? They come in on weekends and supply their own products. That is an incredibly complex question and it wouldn't be possible for me to answer it um, in this form or based on that information. You really have to look at it closely. If they are employed by a separate company, you're gonna, you're gonna be in a much better position to argue that they're not your employees but you would have to look at what your relationship is with those cleaners and how it's set up. And there are just a lot of factors that would have to go into that analysis. I can't just answer that. It's going, or rather I'm gonna give the standard obnoxious attorney answer, which is it depends. Um, and there's one last question I'm gonna publish it is, do waivers with wording related to paying wages executed by subs provide sufficient indemnity? Uh, probably not, but that is um, something that would help protect you. You would, um, it would, the wording would be really important and you would want to have the subs um, show that they've actually paid the wages and that they're taking responsibility for that. It, you would still be um, jointly and severally liable though, but it would give you um, better recourse against the subs. And let's see, oh, what are the, one more question here. Uh, what are the changes for commissions? So there aren't any specific changes with regard to commissions, but the new law that creates a private cause of action for an employee to bring a lawsuit against the employer for non-payment of wages, means that you need to be very careful with commissions that you have a clearly worded agreement or policy spelling out exactly when employees would be um, eligible for the commissions, when they would have earned the commissions. Otherwise, we're gonna be seeing lawsuits for employers, it's lawsuits against employers where the employee claims that they're owed commissions, whereas previously those didn't typically get brought. Um, and there's another question here. Would an employee qualify for EPSL if they were waiting for their COVID-19 test? It depends. If they have symptoms and they're seeking a medical diagnosis, then yes. If they don't have symptoms and they're waiting for the test result, then no, unless they have a doctor's note um, directing them to self-isolate. So again, the annoying attorney answer, it depends. All right, so that, um, we don't have any other questions pending right now. So um, I guess we are done. I thank everyone for their time. Gordon, did you want to say anything else? And I just really want to thank you and Kristen Fletcher and, and Jennifer Serena for all the, the help on this. This was a immensely helpful presentation. It's one that I know I'm going to watch again. One of the questions that someone asked several times, of course, is are you going to share this PowerPoint? And I believe, uh, Van Vinter Black is going to share this with, with everyone who has registered with this as well. So really appreciate it. Uh, and if, can you, if people need to reach out to you and talk to you individually, uh, what's the best way for them to reach you? Sure, my email address is always the best way to reach me and that's in the materials. You can also find me on my firm's website, vanblacklaw.com. Uh, but my email address is abbo at vanblacklaw.com and I'd be happy to help anyone who has questions on these issues. Very good. Thank you so much. Really appreciate y'all's time today. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody.